Why do you think that evangelicals may make a move to orthodoxy? I hear about this happening from time to time. It does seem that these ancient ecclesiastical and more liturgical traditions do have a real appeal to many contemporary evangelicals who are dissatisfied with what they perceive to be the triviality and emptiness and superficiality of evangelical worship services. That's certainly understandable. When you look at contemporary worship, it does seem very superficial, and I could understand why someone would have a yearning for something more, something deeper. I myself don't feel the tug toward these more liturgical expressions of worship the way many do. But there are quite a number of people who have converted to Roman Catholicism from evangelicalism. I I think, for example, of Eleanor Stump. On the other hand, orthodoxy provides an alternative for those who want to belong to an ancient ecclesiastical tradition, but not in submission to the Bishop of Rome, um, the Pope. Um, These Orthodox churches preserve the ancient patriarchal structure of the church, which included the Bishop of Rome, but also bishops in Alexandria and Jerusalem and Antioch and Constantinople. Uh, And these Orthodox churches would not agree with the primacy of the Bishop of Rome or the Roman pontiff that Roman Catholics hold to. So this gives them an opportunity to have a more ancient ecclesiastical and liturgical tradition that isn't Roman Catholic. So orthodoxy has a certain appeal to persons who enjoy this liturgical style of worship and also and we might talk more about this, the more mystical tradition that orthodoxy affords. Do we, as evangelicals and Protestants, do we often lose maybe a sense of mystery or some of the liturgical benefits? I think that's a little too casual. Yes, very casual. I mean, some worship services are just scandalous. There was a Roman Catholic young woman who used to come to Defender's class, and she characterized the worship services here as a concert followed by a lecture. (laughs) (laughs) And she missed the celebration of the Eucharist and the other elements of the liturgy. So I, I think that that's definitely true, that in many cases we have lost a deep sense of reverence and awe that can go with meaningful Christian worship, but I at least don't find that to be had in more liturgical forms of worship. And there's always Anglicanism that would still provide a Reformation alternative to these other Christian confessions. So we all go through seasons of our life, Bill, where we need more of something than another, or we've been doing something for uh, the same way for such a long time that maybe we need a little shift or a change. Here, here's what he says in this interview that you quoted. He says, I have been typically more skewed toward truth, mm. and quite frankly, Kathy more skewed towards life. But today we are on precisely the same page in life and in truth, and we're loving it. Daily we thank God that he has saved us by grace alone through an active faith in our dear Lord Jesus Christ. So there was something about worship in this Orthodox Church that seemed to pour fresh water upon the dry and arid ground of Hank Hanegraaff's soul. Mm -hmm. It had become intellectualized and not experiential and he has apparently experienced a sort of revitalization of his Christian life through worship in this orthodox community. That's Mm -hmm. interesting because one of the things that characterizes Eastern Orthodoxy is its more mystical approach to Christianity and Roman Catholicism 
you have very carefully delineated doctrinal statements and uh, catechesis um, in certain Protestant denominations too. Doctrinal development is very fine, but in orthodoxy, one's connection with God is more mystical and ah rational, and. For that reason, there is greater use of icons, for example, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, whereas Protestants have shunned the use of images, and Catholics would not advocate the use of icons either. Icons. Icons are these highly stylized depictions of either the Trinity or the mother and child. You've probably seen pictures of these. They often have a kind of pale, greenish, flesh tone hue, a very flat, non-three-dimensional sort of look to them. They're very odd sorts of paintings, if you will. Mm -hmm. For the Orthodox, these are not just images or paintings. These are like portals to the supernatural. Through these icons, you can gain access to the realm of the supernatural and the mystical. And this is not a kind of rational access. It is a more mystical communion with God. The the emphasis on mysticism in the Orthodox tradition was brought home to me very powerfully through a conversation several years ago with a Russian Orthodox geophysicist when I was in St. Petersburg. This was shortly after the fall of the Iron Curtain, and there was a tremendous turning to God in Russia, which meant for them a return to the Russian Orthodox Church. And this Russian Orthodox scientist said to me, or explained to me, how much closer he, as an Orthodox Christian, felt to evangelicals than he did to Roman Catholics because of the evangelical emphasis upon the Holy Spirit Mm. and being filled with the Holy Spirit. The the, the charismatic dimension of Christianity was something that appealed to him as an Orthodox believer because it was more akin to mystical experience. And he explained this to me by saying that in Roman Catholic theology, the Holy Spirit is conceived to proceed from the Father and the the Son. The Son is the second person of the Trinity, the Logos of God, and the Spirit comes from God the Father via the Logos, via the Son, and then to us. Whereas in orthodoxy, the Spirit proceeds directly from the Father, not through the Logos. Now, if you think, Kevin, of the Logos as reason, rationality, you can see where that would lead to a kind of intellectualizing of the experience of the Spirit by thinking that it's mediated by the Logos. Whereas for the Orthodox believer, at least this man, the experience of the Holy Spirit was not logical, not rational, because it didn't come through the Logos. It was immediate to God the Father, and that would bear out exactly what I've been talking about, this mystical access to God that is not rational. It's ah, ah-rational. And this sort of experiential approach seems to have had a great appeal to Hank Hanegraaff. Christianity Today says that this idea that you're talking about here, Bill, is called theosis, the experience of God the Eastern Orthodox teaching on seeking union with God. Yes, theosis or divinization is the idea that we somehow come to partake of the divine nature. Now, this can sound like pantheism, right? That somehow we become God, Mm -hmm. um, that we become divinized and so forth. But that's not what the Eastern Orthodox mean by that. They recognize that God has essential properties like necessity, eternity, omnipotence, omniscience, and so forth, and that I never will come to partake of those properties. I will never be omniscient and holy and omnipotent and eternal and necessary. But what they mean is that I come to have this sort of mystical union with God 
God and so partake in the divine nature as well. And in that sense, that's unobjectionable. I mean, Protestant theologians often talk about our mystical union with Christ, that we are in Christ um, insofar as we are regenerated by his Holy Spirit and in a state of grace, we are in Christ and thus have a kind of mystical union with him. But that is emphasized even more strongly in this Eastern tradition and seems to have spoken deeply to Hannah Graff's heart. Bill, as we conclude the podcast today, one thing about Eastern Orthodoxy is that many are drawn to it for another reason, and that is they want to try to get back to the first century church, to the New Testament church, and they think that Orthodoxy, Roman Catholicism, other things like that are, are the way to do that. But I would ask you, don't, don't we all who belong to the Church of Jesus Christ want to be a New Testament church? I think I mean, that's absolutely right, Kevin. People who converted from evangelicalism to orthodoxy early on, like Peter Gilquist, would claim that they are getting back to the New Testament church by becoming orthodox. And I think that's a bogus argument. When you read the pages of the New Testament, that gives you a picture of what the New Testament church is like. And that could be any local congregation in any town that is unrelated to submission to a patriarch or um, a bishop that would be over these various churches, much less that would represent the kind of developed tradition that exists within orthodoxy. I think we can all aspire to get back to the New Testament church in terms of its, its primitive beliefs. In fact, I would say that of the churches that I've worshipped in, the one that would probably have the most plausible claim to be like the New Testament church, would be the Brethren. Um, when we were in England, we worshipped at a Plymouth Brethren church. And in these churches, um, there was no appointed minister who would preach every Sunday. Instead, there were elders, and anyone could stand up during the service, uh, share a song or a scripture reading or give an exhortation. Sounded very much like the kind of worship service that you have in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, where various prophets would get up and, and speak and the others would weigh what is said. That sort of worship service to me probably comes closest to what was going on in the New Testament in these local communities where there were no professional clergy uh, and, and there were just local Christian groups that would meet together. But we don't need to try to imitate the style of worship of these early churches. What we need to be sure is that we're on the same page with them doctrinally in, in what we believe and in our common mission to fulfill the Great Commission and preach the gospel to every nation, baptizing them and making disciples in the name of the Lord. Well, I want to express as well my thanks for the privilege of taking place or part in this uh, dialogue. Uh, I was very eager to join with Bishop Barron in uh, doing the event this evening, and I think it's wonderful to have this symposium as well before. It's evident from the topic he's chosen that Robert Barron is not one to shy away from controversy. <laughs> for he has elected to defend one of the most controversial of the divine traditional attributes, namely divine simplicity. He has ably stated that doctrine in its most radical Thomistic form and fairly and forcefully stated several of the objections which have led many, if not most, contemporary Christian philosophers, not to speak of theologians, to reject it. Uh, alas, I find myself among them. <laughs>
It seems to me that the question is not whether God is simple, but whether divine simplicity is best understood along Thomistic lines. Consider the three objections Bishop Barron mentions to the Thomistic construal of divine simplicity. One, the Thomistic construal is unbiblical. I must confess that I could not agree more with the objector that drawing far more on pagan philosophical sources than on scriptural witness, Aquinas has presented a deeply distorted and hopelessly abstract notion of God more akin to a Buddhist abyss or a Hindu absolute than to the living, personal, and very particular God of the Bible." End quote. The roots of Thomas' doctrine are to be found not in the Bible, but in Neoplatonism. For thinkers like Proclus and Plotinus, the one is an absolutely undifferentiated unity from which all multiplicity derives. By contrast, in the Bible, God is described as a positive being who has properties like holiness, power, eternality, goodness, personhood, and so forth. <clears throat> Whereas other divine attributes like omnipotence, omnipresence, eternality, holiness, and so on, find support in the biblical text, there is no support for Thomistic simplicity. Aquinas' treatment of Exodus 3.14, I am that I am, is a classic case of eisegesis. If this statement in the mind of the Pentateuchal author was meant to be a metaphysically heavy statement, rather than just a way of saying, don't stick your nose into things that don't concern you, then why take it as a proof text of Thomistic simplicity rather than a proof text of divine aseity, self-existence, or metaphysical necessity, broadly logically necessary existence? Aquinas reads his thesis of the identity of divine essence and existence into, not out of, the passage. The terrible consequence of Thomism is that all the wonderful biblical attributes for which we worship him are annihilated by divine simplicity. For the pure act of being is not delimited by any essence. God becomes an unintelligible blank. God is no longer religiously accessible except through mystical experience. Bishop Barron insists that under the rubric of the Via Positiva, we must also say that God is intelligent, loving, providential, personal, powerful, etc., etc. The problem is that these positive predicates cannot be literally ascribed to God on Thomism. They are at best analogical, but God is not literally personal, nor does he love you nor is he active in the world. For the pure act of being has no properties and stands in no real relations. Two, Thomistic simplicity falsely makes God a property. Bishop Barron's response is telling, quote, instead of saying that God is a property or set of properties, one should say that God has no properties. Yes, and that is precisely the problem. The pure act of being is inconceivable because it has no properties. We really have no idea what we are talking about. Three, Thomistic simplicity brings about a modal collapse. Since God is absolutely simple across possible worlds, never knowing or doing anything differently, modal distinctions collapse. And there is, in effect, only one possible world. God can have no contingent knowledge or action, for everything about him is essential to him. Since God knows that P is logically equivalent to P is true, the necessity of the former entails the necessity of the latter. Thus, divine simplicity leads to an extreme fatalism according to which everything that happens does so with logical necessity. Bishop Barron tries to avert this unwelcome consequence by appealing to the Thomistic doctrine 
But while creatures are really related to God, God is not really related to creatures. The problem with this doctrine is that it makes the existence of creatures inexplicable. Since God is absolutely the same in a possible world in which no creatures exist, as he is in a world chock full of creatures, the explanation of the difference cannot be found in God. But neither can it be found in creatures, for they come too late in the order of explanation to account for why they exist or not. It follows that on Thomism, there just is no explanation of the existence of creatures or the differences between possible worlds, which seems absurd. Now, in light of these objections, it seems to me imperative that we retrace our steps and ask ourselves where things went wrong. It seems to me that the most plausible candidate for the crucial misstep is Aquinas' affirmation of a real distinction between essence and existence. It is this that lies at the root of the causal regress that terminates in something uncomposed of essence and existence, but just is existence itself. Why think that beings are metaphysically composed of essence and existence? Bishop Barron says, everything in our immediate experience <coughs> is marked by a real distinction between essence and existence, for we can contemplate their natures apart from their acts of existence. But this suffices to show only a conceptual distinction between essence and existence. Compare properties. On Aquinas' view, properties are merely entia rationis, not mind-independent realities. They are formed by the minds abstracting from an object everything except for the particular feature in question. They are no more really distinct things than, say, the southern exposure of a house is a thing distinct from the house. Deny the real, extinct, uh, the real distinction between essence and existence, and the nerve of Thomism is cut. Finally, that leads to the question, how then ought we to understand divine simplicity? Well, how about this? We reject constituent ontologies. We should not think of things as metaphysically composed in any way. In this sense, everything is simple. But there are still positive predications true of them, including God. If we want, we can strengthen divine simplicity by adding that God is not composed of separable parts. That suffices for a biblical and philosophically intelligible doctrine of divine simplicity. The Thomistic interpretation of divine simplicity is not essential to Catholic theology. To be sure, the Catholic Church, like the Protestant reformers, affirmed divine simplicity. The Fourth Lateran Council declares God to be absolutely simple, and the First Vatican Council completely simple. But neither council cashes out these expressions in Thomistic <coughs> terms. Their statements are consistent with interpretations of divine simplicity that are not committed to the radical Thomistic theses that God has no properties, but is the pure act of being unconstrained by any essence, or that God stands in no real relations to the world. Catholics who balk at these claims should feel free to embrace a different understanding of divine simplicity than that offered by Thomas Aquinas. During the great persecution of Christians initiated by the Roman Emperor Diocletian at the beginning of the 300s, there were four Caesars ruling different parts of the Roman Empire. 
two senior Caesars and two subordinate Caesars. Constantine was the son of the Caesar Constantius, who ruled Britain and Gaul. Constantius did not pursue the persecution of Christians as the other Caesars in the empire did. And when Constantius died, his son Constantine decreed a formal end to the persecution in his region and returned to Christians all of the goods that had been taken from them during the persecutions. Well, war among these competing Caesars eventually broke out, and in 312, Constantine, with his armies, uh, marched out of Gaul and into Italy. As he approached Rome, the contemporary church historian Eusebius says that while marching at midday, and I quote, he saw with his own eyes in the heavens a trophy of the cross arising from the light of the sun, carrying the message, in this sign you shall conquer. Constantine had a dream that same night in which Christ appeared with the same heavenly sign and told him to make a standard for his army with that form. Constantine then won a very quick victory and was declared to be Augustus Caesar, or the venerable Caesar. Constantine credited the Christian God for his victory. In 313, he and his co-emperor, Licinius, issued the Edict of Milan, officially granting full tolerance to Christianity and indeed to all religions throughout the Roman Empire. Within a few years, however, Licinius reneged on the religious freedom promised in the Edict of Milan and began to oppress uh, Christians again in his region. Well, that constituted a challenge for Constantine, climaxing in the Great Civil War of 324 in which Constantine emerged as the sole emperor of the Roman Empire. Constantine was the first Christian emperor of the Roman Empire, and he was zealous to promote the Christian faith. He was responsible, for example, for convening the famous Council of Nicaea in 325, where the Nicene Creed was promulgated. In 330, Constantine made the remarkable decision to move the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome in the west to Constantinople, uh, or Byzantium, rather, in the east. And he quite quickly uh, discerned that uh, Byzantium was a far more defensible site and more strategically located in the empire than Rome. And he proposed to call the new capital New Rome. But it quickly became known as his namesake, namely Constantinople. Constantine's instincts were vindicated by subsequent history. In 476, Rome fell to the barbarian invaders. But Constantinople, surrounded by its miles of massive triple walls, remained impregnable right up until the 13th century. After Rome's demise, the Roman Empire, with its capital now in Constantinople, continued to flourish in the east, and its citizens thought of themselves as and called themselves Romans. In Constantinople, manuscripts of ancient Greek and Latin authors were preserved despite their widespread destruction uh, in the West, thereby both classical learning and the writings of the Church Fathers were preserved. Constantinople became the cradle of Greek-speaking Eastern Orthodox Christianity. Moreover, Constantinople also became 
Europe's outpost, inhibiting for centuries the spread of Islam into Europe. Unlike the Roman Catholic Church, Eastern Orthodoxy recognizes the Bishop of Rome as merely the first among equals, in Latin primus inter pares, first among equals. The bishops of Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, and Constantinople were also recognized as patriarchs of the church equal in authority, if not in eminence, to the bishop of Rome. For orthodoxy, ultimate authority resides in the decrees of the ecumenical councils of the church, of which seven were recognized. The linguistic differences between the Latin-speaking West and the Greek-speaking East, as well as the deep cultural differences and the political divide between East and West, made it difficult to preserve the unity of the church, even though both recognize the authority of the seven ecumenical councils. Certainly the Roman Church's claim to the supremacy of the Pope or the Bishop of Rome made it impossible for the Eastern Churches to fully embrace Roman Christianity. But the difference between East and West is far more fundamental than that. Eastern Orthodoxy has a much more mystical approach to God and to Christian faith than does the West. This deep difference came to a boil over the addition of the so-called filioque clause to the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed of 381. That creed confesses belief in the Holy Spirit, quote, who proceeds from the Father. End quote. In the year 1014, so some 700 years later, theologians in the West added to the creed the words filioque, Eastern Orthodoxy repudiates this addition to the creed. Their complaint is far more than the fact that this phrase represents an addition to the original ecumenical creed and so lacks the authority of an ecumenical council. Rather, the phrase serves to epitomize the deep differences in approach to Christian faith between the East and the West. Spirit proceeds directly from the Father without the filter of the Logos. This affords a more mystical, ah rational approach to the Father. Mystical communion with God takes precedence over the enunciation of propositional truths about God. Reject the scholastic approach to Christianity as pagan and tantamount to heresy. A theologian who has not come to know God in a deep, personal way is not qualified to do genuine theology. He just minces words. He actually impedes the knowledge of God by his rationalistic disquisitions. Now, if you were to ask me for my own evaluation of this dispute, I'm inclined to think that the whole doctrine of the procession of the Son and the Spirit is unbiblical and misconceived. And so I'm not inclined to side with either Catholicism or Orthodoxy on that specific question. But as to what that question epitomizes, I should say that as the name reasonable faith indicates, we should not think that an intimate, personal relationship with God need exclude the rational mind. Now, I am inclined to agree that Roman Catholic theology 
and Thomism in particular has been polluted by Aristotelian philosophy. And in that sense, I sympathize with the Orthodox thinkers. But that is no reason to abandon rational thought about the divine. Rather, it is a call to think more deeply and more clearly about uh, the divine. The very ecumenical creeds themselves are shot through with philosophical conceptions about substance, essence, person, and so forth. I think that mysticism is inherently dangerous precisely because it is irrational and therefore unconstrained by reason. It can therefore easily lead its practitioners into error. We can cultivate a closer relationship with God even as we think logically and rigorously about his nature and work. Well, the decisive event in the schism between East and West finally occurred in the year 1054. This rupture of East and West only widened in ensuing years. And so 1054 is taken to be the date of the separation of Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. Meanwhile, migratory Turks from Eastern Asia began moving into Anatolia, or modern-day Turkey. Still, Constantinople continued to grow, and during the Middle Ages, it became the richest and largest city in Europe. The Third and Fourth Crusades were launched to take Jerusalem back from Muslim control. But in one of the most shameful acts of perfidy in Christian history, the Fourth Crusade, out of greed and jealousy, was diverted from its objective of taking Jerusalem and ignoring the protests of the Pope, it launched an attack upon Constantinople instead. In April of 1204, for the first time in its history, the walls of Constantinople were breached. For three days, the Crusaders sacked the city, looting, murdering, raping, burning, and destroying priceless treasures. In his book, Byzantium and Europe, Speras Virantis describes what happened, and I quote, the Latin soldiery subjected the greatest city in Europe to an indescribable sack. For three days, they murdered, raped, looted, and destroyed on a scale which even the ancient Vandals and Goths would have found unbelievable. The French and others destroyed indiscriminately, halting to refresh themselves with wine, violation of nuns, and murder of Orthodox clerics. The Crusaders vented their hatred for the Greeks most spectacularly in the destruction of the greatest church in Christendom. They smashed the silver iconostasis, the icons, and the holy books of the Hagia Sophia, and seated upon the patriarchal throne a whore who sang coarse songs as they drank wine from the church's holy vessels. The estrangement of East and West, which had proceeded over the centuries, culminated in the horrible massacre that occurred in, that accompanied the conquest of Constantinople. The Greeks were convinced that even the Turks, had they taken the city, would not have been as cruel as the Latin Christians. What an incredible tragedy uh, in church history. Eventually, after a half century of Latin rule, the Greeks did wrest control of Constantinople back from the Latins but the city had been fatally weakened, making it vulnerable to Turkish invasion, and thus facilitating the very victory of Islam that the Crusaders had been meant to undo.